Well, every blessing to you all. Welcome back to my open air pulpits. I guess officially we are now in the winter, middle of November, so I guess this is officially winter time, although it feels more like autumn than winter. We've been very blessed over the last, what, three to six months, enjoying warmer than usual weather, a beautiful Indian summer. But of course, as we go later into what's left of what, 2021, going into 2022, it will get colder and more windy, more wet and harder for me to come up to the open air pulpit. But I wanted to come up this morning anyway. I gave myself a goal back in July, I think it was, to read through the entire Bible. I wanted to do it in around, what, two to three months. That was the goal anyway, but due to uh, other projects, other tasks and uh, preoccupations, and allow me to be honest, due to laziness, I didn't stick with it. But what I did do, night before last, was finish the book of Judges. And Judges is a fascinating book way back in the Old Testament, around perhaps 1400 BC or thereabouts. And I guess it's like if I was to record the entire book of Judges, like verse by verse, maybe one day I will, I'd probably break it down into three sections, and I'd probably start with, uh, let's see now, uh, possibly Jephthah, found over in chapter 11, and uh, probably Samson later on, but uh, I will certainly want to look at the chap that we're going to look at this morning from chapter 19. Two out of the three characters I've just mentioned are saved and in heaven today. And yet, if you were to read through Judges, and only Judges, you wouldn't have thought that. So if you think back to when Abraham was offering up Isaac, his favourite son, people sometimes overlook the fact that Isaac went along with it, didn't fight Abraham. Or Jephthah, like I say, when he was about to sacrifice his daughter, <coughs> she too goes along with it, doesn't fight against it. So Isaac, I guess a type of Christ, if you will, and Jephthah's daughter, a type of the church, if you will, are in submission to their fathers. Both fascinating accounts when it comes to faith, what real faith is. And many times we focus on the fathers from both uh, parts of the scripture, Judges 11 and uh, Genesis 22, but sometimes it's worth thinking about the son and the daughter from both accounts and how they were very much uh, in submission to their father's wills. Or someone like Samson, you think about Samson, a Nazarite, born a Nazarite, uh, took the vows obviously, and yet would have what, three lovers? Would kill people left, right and centre would fall foul of Jehovah uh, concerning his love for Delilah, would uh, tell the truth to her, like how his power came from his hair, is arrested by the Philistines, but of course the Jews helped the Philistines to arrest Samson, talk about treachery. He goes off to the prison house, he's grinding, and that term, grinding, probably a throwback to Samson grinding in the prison house. They take out his eyes. He's making sport for the Philistines. And right at the end of his life, what, 20 years serving Israel, three lovers, killed people all over the place, enjoyed alcohol, defiled his vows. He says, oh God, remember me. Allow me to avenge the Philistines for my eyes, so on and so forth. And of course, his hair is growing back, and the Lord allows him his uh, petition. And of course, you know, the rest, he sinks the whole house. He brings the house down, and of course, they all die. It's a suicide. Now, without the New Testament, you would probably think that Samson is in hell today. For many years, the Church of Rome and other churches taught that suicide was the unpardonable sin, which of course it's not. Or without the New Testament, you may think that Jephthah, from Judges 11 would be in hell today, but no, according to Hebrews 11, both sons of Israel are in heaven today. 
This of course is the issue concerning standing and state, the paradox of scripture. And I guess if you are a holiness preacher, uh, this must be very difficult for you. How do you harmonize the New Testament with the Old Testament, the Old Testament with the New Testament? It's difficult for preachers, all of us, to get the balance right. We don't want to give the appearance that sin is okay, because of course the soul that sins shall surely die. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What we don't want to do is just brush it under the carpet and say it's okay, when of course it's not. You reap what you sow. But at the same time, we've got to be honest and consistent with Scripture when it comes to... Uh, what happens to people who basically live after the flesh. So I thought for this morning, I would look at uh, Judges chapter 19, just read through it uh, casually, not go too deep, and uh, just profile a very interesting character. But I guess the main uh, point, if I was to briefly sum up Judges, is quote that verse, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Also one other thing, before I get into chapter 19. It's funny how the heathen many times uh, follow what's in the Word of God without even knowing what's in the Word of God. It's like people say this, they say, uh, he gave up the ghost, quoting scripture. Or they say, uh, get your house in order, quoting scripture. Or the spirit is winning, but the flesh is weak, quoting scripture. And over the years I've uh, commented to those that I know, even my own family, <laughs> not realizing they are quoting scripture. But I saw a thing a few nights ago on Facebook. Apparently in parts of Central and South America, they have a custom where the men basically drive around looking to pick up wives. And they grab women uh, off trains, off the street, even out of cars, I mean, moving cars. Places like Kazakhstan, South America, of course, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Russian states, but Central America, South America, uh, countries you hear very little about really. And that custom takes place to this day in around 30 countries. But of course, what those people don't realize is that what they are doing is following what took place in Judges, like the last chapter. Because by the time we get through this chapter this morning, you're going to have an almost civil war kicking off due to the debauchery of a Levite. Let's start in Judges 19 verse 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. There's your first red flag. The country is rudderless. No leadership per se. Feels like that in the UK. We have a queen. She's been on the throne for what? 60 years? 70 years? She came on the throne what? Way back in 51, 52. And we have really gone downhill since she came on the throne that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah, a Levite. The highest priest class way back in the Old Testament. The Levites would carry the Ark of the Covenant. The Levites would offer sacrifices on behalf of Israel. They would assist the high priest every year, like the Day of Atonement. So you got a Levite on the surface, an upright man, I guess, Every Jewish mother, like uh, Samson's mother, uh, make that Samuel's mother, but also Samson. Yeah, we can go Samson and Samuel. Uh, both mothers would uh, dedicate their sons to the Lord. Of course, Samuel was a prophet, uh, and Samson was a carnal leader, not necessarily a prophet, but he was a man filled with the Holy Ghost. And I guess for every Jewish mother during biblical times, it must have been a great uh, honor if the Lord uh, called your son to be a priest. In the Catholic Church for many, many years, uh, if you had a son, probably not so much now, but going back maybe 50 or 60 years, if you lived in Ireland, for example, especially in Ireland, if you had a son, you were very keen for your son to be a priest. And of course, if you look at priests over the years or famous leaders or movie stars, people like uh, Martin Scorsese, a Roman Catholic, wanted to be a priest, and yet look at his movies today, littered with the F word, the C word, J, C, O, M, G. I mean, the litter, the, the language that comes out of these people's mouths just litters the streets. It's just disgusting. Or people like Adolf Hitler, even Heinrich Himmler, or Joseph Goebbels wanted to be priests. But back in biblical times, if you 
had a son, it was a great honor for you if your son became a priest. It came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, not even a queen. The country is rudderless, like I say. People doing their own thing, basically. That there was a certain Levite, so the priest system is still up and running. A certain Levite sojourning, traveling on the side of Mount Ephraim, who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Israel was broken down into two tribes. The uh, ten tribes would make up the uh, northern parts of Israel. Ephraim, Manasseh, north, north uh, Israel, or the northern kingdoms of Israel. And of course, the southern tribes would be uh, Judah and Benjamin. So you think to yourself, what's going on? You've got this Levite, he's traveling from A to B. He's out of his jurisdiction. And as he's traveling around, he picks up a concubine. Of course, the term concubine, from memory, first appears back in Genesis uh, concerning Abraham, of all people. Again, standing estates, what's going on? Abraham offers up Isaac, and he would have done it, incidentally, had God not stopped him. Wonderful man, the father of many nations, argued with God back in Genesis. Oh, that Ishmael might live. Never mind Isaac, he says. How about Ishmael? He's my firstborn. And the Lord uh, works with Abraham's argumentative spirits, a bit like he would do with Simon Peter in Acts chapter 10. But later in life, Abraham remarries and he starts to collect concubines. Now, concubine is a half-wife, and that's putting it uh, conservatively. And we would say today she's basically a sex slave, purchased like you purchased animal and this levite in some ways is going to mirror hosea but not quite he picks up this concubine concubine a young woman she called a damsel later on he buys her probably he's older than she is obviously out of bethlehem judah so you got the uh, two kingdoms coming together as he's traveling around look at verse two and his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him under I went away, uh, excuse me, I went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there for whole months. Always love the attention to detail. Not just four months, for whole months. So let's back up. He's a priest, he's a Levite. He's not just an ordinary priest, he's a Levite. He's the top of the crop, if you will, called for temple service, uh, which will come, of course, after David had died. So he's taking care of the uh, tabernacle interceding for the sins of his people outwardly he's a very righteous man but of course people make the mistake of looking on the outward appearance whereas god looks on the inward appearance but so far you think maybe this guy isn't so bad but of course as you read along you find he's got himself a concubine on top of that she's playing the whore against him again it's like hosea and his wife hosea was a good man of course and god said to hosea pick yourself a whore not just any old woman, but a whore, marry her, do it publicly, and that wasn't bad enough. I want you to have children with her. A couple of sons, and I want Israel to see how a good man like you, picturing Jehovah, uh, would marry a whore like Israel, have children with her, type of the church. The whore would uh, play away, and I want you to take her back picture of Israel coming back go back to verse 1 again and it came to pass in those days over a period of time when there was no king in Israel of course it starts with a monarchy then it all falls apart in fact it starts initially with a theocracy then it becomes a monarchy then it all falls apart you read about that in first Samuel chapter 8 that there was a certain Levite a priest like I say sojourning traveling on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem Judah picks up this young girl in his travels and his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem Judah and was there for whole months. Now you could say this that he drove her away but of course that's speculation we don't know that but nevertheless he's in the wrong. Levites weren't to marry whores. Levites weren't to marry even divorced women. Levites were told to marry virgins they weren't even allowed to defile themselves but again going back to Hosea type of God the Father, picking up a whore, type of Israel, 
and of course the sons born to Hosea's wife, we could suggest our types of the church. Uh, innocent, blemish-free, going back to imputation. But I'm probably running ahead of myself. Look at verse 3. And a husband arose. He's referred to as a husband. And yet a concubine that was given to a man, or a concubine purchased by a man, wasn't uh, given a ceremonial marriage to the man in question. See, it goes back to when flesh meets flesh. That technically is a marriage. Now, Adam was created, obviously. Eve came from Adam. And of course, woman means uh, possibly a man with a womb. But not only that, the woman comes from the man. So God takes Eve from Adam. She has no father or mother. She comes from Adam. And they will be called Adam. God marries them together. So technically, that's a wedding, if you will. But if you go through the entire Bible, when flesh meets flesh, you have a marriage. No rings, no ceremonies. You have uh, other ceremonies in Scripture, obviously, but because flesh has met flesh, this Levite is called a husband. Husband arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her. This guy's a real complicated character. I mean, he really is. He's a Levite. He should be about his father's business. He should be at the temple or the tabernacle, as it would be around this time in Israel's history. But no, he's got a wandering eye. He's a bit like uh, Lot, lustful, carnal. And it says they went after her to speak friendly unto her, sweet talker, charmer, perhaps, and to bring her again, having a servant with him. He's got a servant. This is a well-to-do Levite. And a couple of asses, like donkeys. He's not walking, he's traveling on we would say horseback today, but he was traveling with an ass, donkeys, plural. And she brought him into her father's house. When the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. This is the first time that her father, referred to here as his father-in-law, has met his son-in-law. Because again, when flesh meets flesh, you have a marriage in the modern sense of the term. She's a whore. She's been stepping out on him. She's gone back to her father's house. She's tried to escape and he's found her and he wants her back. Now again, you say to yourself, well, what a wicked man. Yes, he was a wicked man. But even a wicked man can be a type of God the Father. Keep reading with me. Four, and his father-in-law, the damsel's father, young woman, damsel, retained him. Wouldn't let him go. And he bowed with him three days. So they did eat and drink and lodge there. I remember speaking to an Irishman many years ago. One of the first people I witnessed to when I got saved. And I couldn't get anywhere with him. A very bitter elderly Catholic. But he made some interesting, uh, or he shared some interesting stories with me when I first got saved about what it was like living in Ireland. Or growing up in Ireland in the, let's see now, uh, 1950s. And of course he could remember even before that what it was like and he would say this that in his part of Ireland I forget where he was from in Ireland uh, the priests were like God basically the people were terrified of the priests and he would say that if his parents didn't go to mass every Sunday the priest would go looking for his parishioners knock on the door and basically interrogate his people where were you last Sunday why weren't you at mass what's your reason for being absent now today, Ireland is basically an atheist country. Uh, if you are a priest in Ireland, you wear civvies, <laughs> like what I'm wearing, I suppose, just normal clothing. You don't wear clerical gear, because of course if you do, you are jumped upon, spat at, attacked on the streets, literally, going back to all the paedophilia, which the Church of Rome just can't shake off. In fact, was it last month? Church of Rome in uh, France, had to come clean that 300,000 children over what 50 years have been abused by thousands of Catholic priests and yet it makes no difference Pelosi goes to mass every Sunday Biden goes to mass every Sunday perhaps Boris and Carrie or Carrie whatever her name is go to mass every Sunday I made a documentary about four or five years ago uh, on this very subject, and you'll find it on our 2020 channel, 
And I made the argument then that Catholics in America, and also in the UK, but especially in America, in fact, it probably goes both ways, actually, but in America, they're more open about their religion, whereas in this country, they're more uh, reserved. But when that scandal broke in America about the abuse in, uh, was it Pennsylvania? A terrible story, again, of children being abused going back to the 60s. Big news, and uh, lawyers were lining up to, uh, to sue the Catholic Church. And I watched that very carefully, and uh, I felt very sorry for those uh, Catholics in America, or Ireland, or France, or in the UK. In this country, the Church of Rome have got away with absolute murder. They really have. I mean, in this country, prelates are treated so revealingly, it's just sickening. But at the time, I thought how interesting it was to see Melania Trump go down to the Mexican border when that uh, incident was taking place. It's even worse now, and of course Camilla hasn't gone down, or Kamala, as she's known, or Biden hasn't gone down to meet these people. A lot of pressure on Trump to send people down to the border, and of course Melania went in the end. I thought, isn't it interesting how she flew all that way from, where was it now, let's see now, Washington to Texas, was it Texas? My geography might be slightly off now, but from Washington to uh, Texas, was it four to six hours flying time on Air Force One? And yet, Pennsylvania, about an hour or two from Washington, D.C. I thought, why didn't she fly up to Pennsylvania and comfort the victims of pedophilia from her own church? Why didn't Nancy go up there or Joe Biden? This is the hypocrisy of Roman Catholics in Britain and America. She went down to the Mexican border was there a couple of hours, looked very bored, and then she flew back to Washington. So much I could say about that. And his father-in-law, verse 4, the, uh, the damsel's father attained him. He's getting a kick having a Levite in his home. And he bode with him three days. Three days is a long time to spend with somebody. So that it eats and drink and a lodge there. Son, stay put, he's saying. I've heard many good things about you. If I go back to verse 3 latter part so when the father of the damsel saw him he rejoiced to meet him it wasn't long ago i can still remember coming home from school on many occasion and priests would be having coffee with my parents cigarette smoke everywhere all the priests that i knew smoked and walk into the room smoke everywhere and my parents would be talking to the priests and uh, had good rapport with our parish priest and all the priests that I can remember growing up uh, being around basically and even then there was still a level of reverence I suppose towards men of the cloth as they were known so this guy he's got a loose woman for a daughter a whore a concubine she's obviously poor he can't take care of her so he sold her on to somebody else he's never met this Levite until now going back to my elderly Irish friend priests knocking on the doors why weren't you at mass last sunday blah 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 you're going to go to hell it's a mortal sin not to go to church that's what they taught up until vatican II. look at five and it came to pass on the fourth day when they arose early in the morning that he rose up to depart and the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread and afterward go your way there's no rush stay put i'm so honored to have a levite in my home go back to last year you had all the blm marches all over america and some in the uk and politicians in this country and in the us were marching arm in arm arm in arm with the blm a radical marxist anti-white organization and yet some of those people marching with the blm in the uk and the us were roman catholic weren't marching with the victims of pedophilia were they you didn't see melania or nancy or joe biden linking arms with their people, victims of paedophilia, or go back to early this year, 6th of January, Trump's whipping up the crowds, he says let's go march on Congress, they call it the Hill of course, and he's got his family present, and I thought that he was going to march them, you know, from the front, rather foolishly, he went back to the White House, and none of his sons, none of his daughters linked arms and marched up towards 
Capitol Hill demanding justice for their father and the stolen votes, at least with Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, you knew he stood with those guys, or Gandhi or Marcus in Cyprus. See again, this is the hypocrisy of politicians. And I saw British politicians marching last year in the streets of London, arm in arm, as, uh, insulting police officers, attacking white people, using terms that I wouldn't even repeat on camera this morning because it's fashionable to march with such people and yet you've got victims of paedophilia in France, Ireland, UK, US and no famous Catholic celebrity like Bono, a Roman Catholic or uh, Hollywood stars like Robert De Niro would spend five minutes with such people. This is the stink of religious hypocrisy. Look at six and they sat down and they'd eat and drink both of them together it's like a party, isn't it? For the damsel's father has said unto the man, Be content, I pray thee, and tarry all night. Let thine heart be merry. This guy can't believe it. I guess it's like having a Jesuit, or a Dominican, or a Franciscan into your house if you are a Roman Catholic. Was it last week? Or was it last month? Nancy you went to Rome to visit the Pope. She was like a child. Big grin on her face, walked in, no masks incidentally, no social distancing, and the Pope was very happy to meet her. And yet what she believes, what she promotes, or last month, or was it this month, where are we, November? <laughs> Early this month, Biden went to visit the Pope as well, no masks, no gloves, all muckers together. And yet what Biden believes and preaches is what Pelosi teaches and preaches which is officially anathema by the Church of Rome, and yet they're all muckers together. It's just sickening, isn't it? Tell your nights and let thine heart be merry. It's like Christmas time, a very merry Christmas. When the man arose up to depart, verse seven, his father-in-law urged him. Therefore he lodged there again. This guy wants to go home. He's found his young concubine He's paid good money for her, perhaps 30 pieces of silver, we're not told. He's got priestly duties awaiting him back in Jerusalem, like Catholics all over the world today, very political. CND, BLM, uh, LGBTQ and all that stuff, you can't shut them up, can you? Climate change, that's a new one now, very fashionable. COP26 going on in Glasgow at the moment. Let's save Mother Earth, and yet those that are doing the most, or shouting the most, <coughs> are professing Christians. And yet the Word of God says, God will destroy this entire world, and create a new heaven, and a new earth. They don't believe the Bible. Eight, and he rose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart, and the damsel's father said, Comfort thine heart. I pray thee, and they tarried until afternoon, and they eat, and they did eat both of them. Again, this is incredible. This father-in-law, a poor man, probably in awe of his son-in-law being a Levite, like I said, the cream of the crop, way back in biblical times. It's almost, it's almost as if he knows that once the priest has left the home, it's going to be bad news for his daughter. Maybe. The daughter said to her father-in-law, uh, my husband is a very violent man. And because he's so violent, I've had to flee from his wrath. So the old father is trying to keep the son-in-law back for as long as possible to calm him, to pacify him. Because of course, what caused her to run away in the first place? But back up even further than that, what made a so-called priest marry a concubine who becomes a harlot? doesn't even give her full marital status. <coughs> Nine, when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the damsel's father, said unto him, Behold, now the day draweth toward evening, it's getting dark, I pray you tarry all night. Behold, the day groweth to an end, lodge here, that thine heart may be merry, and tomorrow, 
get you early on your way that thou mayest be gone this is I guess his final attempt to possibly perhaps uh, save the life of his daughter we don't know if that's what's going on it probably is it's probably a twofold plan on the one hand get the most out of his son-in-law's visits because he's just bowled over having a priest in his home going back to Catholics historically being beside themselves having a priest in their family that's why most men become priests to please their mothers incidentally but I think what's really going on is he knows that his daughter is running out of time 10 but the man would not tarry that night but he rose up and departed and came over against Jebus which is Jerusalem and there were with him two asses saddled his concubine also was with him he wants to get out he wants to move he's been with his father and all for what six days it's time to uh, pack up the old man is kept there for as long as is possible and the time is now ticking away really as far as his daughter is concerned but the man would not tarry that night verse 10 but he rose up and departed and came over against Ajibuz, which is Jerusalem and there were with him two asses saddled two donkeys saddled ready to go his concubine also was with him you think to yourself this was she going to go on the one of the asses or was she going to walk with him you got three people and two asses two donkeys I think it's probably fair to say she probably possibly not very good English that but she probably would have had her own horse or donkey and the servant would probably have led from the front but I don't know look at 11 when they were by Ajibas the day was far spent and the servant said unto his master come I pray thee let us turn in into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it Jebusites uh, the Hivites uh, the Hittites all let's see now historically descendants of Ham which of course is a cursed line 12 and his master said unto him we will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger like not Jewish that is not the children of Israel we pass over to Gabeah he wants to get to safer uh, lands which is common sense obviously if you're out of your comfort zone it's late at night it's probably misty like it is at the moment you don't feel particularly safe you're traveling with goods on you I mean the asses are worth something and he said unto his servant come let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night in Gabeah or in Ramah and they passed on and went their way and the sun went down upon them when they were by Gabeah Gabeah which belongeth to Benjamin so Benjamin Judah two tribes of Israel of course Paul the Apostle comes from the tribe of Benjamin King Saul would come from the tribe of Benjamin the Benjamites are a bad tribe in the book of, uh, in the book of Judges and as we read through you'll see uh, why they don't do what they should do and yet Paul was a good man started bad but uh, ended good whereas King Saul started good and ended bad look at 15 and they turned aside thither to go in and to lodge in Gabeah and when he went in he sat down in a street of the city but there was no man that took him into his house to lodging not very hospitable first Timothy speaks about an elder being hospitable like opening up his property and taking care of brothers and sisters in the Lord a sister also in first Timothy I think it's five is to wash the feet of uh, traveling uh, Christians basically go the extra mile and uh, shame those that are lost but not just that glorify your father which is in heaven of course look at 16 and behold there came an old man from his work out of the field at evening an old man he's still working evening time which was also of Mount Ephraim and he sojourned in Gabeah but the men of the place were Benjamites slightly negative connotation there and when he lifted up his eyes he saw a wayfaring man in the streets of the city like a traveler and the old man said whither goest thou 
and whence comest thou? Where you're travelling to, my friend, you're like a pilgrim going from A to B. You've got a young woman travelling with you. You've got a servant leading from the front. I can see you are a priest by your religious apparel. This man means well, incidentally, but keep reading with me, 18. And he said unto him, We are parting from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim. From thence am I. And I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord. So pious. And there is no man that receiveth me to house. It could be true, incidentally, that duties are calling him back in Jerusalem, the eternal city. Every priest, if he's a bright priest, is... Uh, fast-tracked to go to Rome and study to be a future bishop uh, and like I say if you are a Catholic mother even to this day I would imagine it's a great honor for you if your son uh, becomes a Catholic priest but of course the reality is that for the Jews during biblical times if they had no tabernacle if they had no temple if they had no sacrifice, if they had no synagogue, they had really nothing at all. Because for many years, they had no Bible either. I mean, the Old Testament was written over many hundreds of years. For the New Testament, the early church only had the Old Testament. It's like I said, over the years, uh, religious people are in a terrible situation if they have no physical location they can lay their hands on. I saw a documentary a few days ago of an American Mormon, a young man who met this Russian young lady and they met in Turkey last year during lockdown. How they could fly around the world, I don't know. Very interesting documentary. And this young Mormon American, about 25, is courting this young Russian lady, early 20s. She's not Mormon. And it's interesting the body language and it's interest in the what they call it sociology that's what they call it the cultures coming together he's an American she's Russian he speaks Russian incidentally and very good I should say and it's interesting to watch these two talking and he's courting with her he wants to marry her I think she's more keen on him than he is on her but it's very interesting because he starts to speak about his past he's 25 and he's had hundreds of women and he's saying to his fiance, uh, you are going to become a Mormon, aren't you? You will get baptized, won't you, before we get married? Because my church is very important to me. And I can hear church bells in the background. I wasn't aware there's a church around here. Maybe it's not church bells. Maybe it's coming from a farm. I don't know. And I think she's probably a virgin. He's not. She's already... Had to force or she's had to force a confession out of him but of course what she doesn't realize is is that in his religion they have what's called polygamy which is still practiced in many parts of america to this day and if she's not careful she'll marry this guy go back to america with him and become a sister wife Nineteen, yet there is both straw and provender for our asses. We're like self-sufficient old men. And there is bread and wine also for me. Bread and wine? Alcohol? Bread and wine for me, of course, alcohol isn't sinful, you understand, but you have a sip or two, and after a while you want a bottle or two. Next thing you know, you are at the AA. There is bread and wine also for me and for thy handmaid. And for the young man which is with thy servants, there is no want of anything. So the old man is really wanting this guy to step into his property. And yet at the same time, the traveling Levites is partly self-sufficient. But of course it's late, it's cold, they're tired, they want someone to lay their heads. Look at 20. And the old man said, Peace be with thee. Howsoever, let all thy wants lie upon me only lodge not in the street don't lie in the street don't sleep in the street it goes back to when the angels came down from heaven back in genesis 18 19 the sin of sodom and gomorrah they wanted to see for themselves just how bad it actually was and again lot another interesting character they have to drag him out of his house he argues with the angels on route out he's got his daughters with him his wife turns back becomes a pillar of salt and most people say he's not in heaven today surely not 
ends up, what, naked in a cave with his two daughters, incest as well, a couple of illegitimate kids born to uh, his two daughters, but he's in heaven today. Again, I feel sorry sometimes for holiness preachers, I really do. I think there's a couple of problems with the, that these guys have. I think, first of all, <coughs> some of those guys have gone straight from school to a seminary, haven't had real jobs, haven't lived in the real world, can't relate to everyday struggles. And also, a lot of these guys haven't really studied the Old Testament or don't believe accounts such as this. Others have come to the Lord later in life and don't want to uh, condone of sin but at the same time you can't rob people of the truth when it comes to standing in states i mean we are saved by faith alone in one who died for us and yet most people still want to put works into the mix they'll say well, i don't do this anymore or i don't do that anymore or well, i was that way or i was that way but i'm no longer that way anymore self-righteous self-righteous and very pharisaical as well Uh, 21. So he brought him into his house and gave provanda unto the asses. Provanda uh, took care of the, uh, the asses, plenty of food for the asses, and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. It goes back to the New Testament, washed the feet of strangers. 22. Now as they were making their hearts merry, it's like a throwback to his father-in-law, Behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, reprobates, sons of Satan, beset the house round about, surrounded it, and beat at the door. It's a throwback to Solomon and Gomorrah, isn't it? Genesis 19. And spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. They want to sodomize him. Now, it goes back to how there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes and the reality is this that god will allow his own people to just run riot i mean god's covenant people for the old testament just behaving like heathen it goes back to that account from first corinthians 5 the guy in corinth he's having sexual relations with his own father's wife mother perhaps mother-in-law and paul says this isn't even spoken about amongst the gentiles of course it is today in the 21st century but in the first century uh, they are more subtle when it came to their sins 23 and the man the master of the house went out unto them and said unto them nay my brethren it's almost word for word uh, from genesis uh, 19 nay my brethren nay i pray you do not so wickedly seeing that this man is come into mine house do not this folly he wants to take care of this man again he's a priest he's a holy man he has an anointing he is cut up he's a cut above all the rest they say today uh in the church of rome it's the church and laity church and laity it takes place also or it's also found in uh, free churches as well you have the uh faculty staff the pastors on salary the deacons and the elders and they rule and run the church basically and people turn up they tithe into that church system they have no say as to how that church system is run and many times the church is owned by the pastor and his wife and if you start to critique the way the church is run you are asked to leave nay my brethren no my brothers nay i pray you do not so wickedly he's got that right seeing that this man has come into my house do not this folly don't sodomize him in public what will the neighbours say? <laughs> Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and is a concubine. Then will I bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. He wants to sacrifice his own daughter and the Levite's concubine. He wants to protect the priest. Like today, you won't find famous Catholics in Britain or America coming out publicly and calling for the arrest of the nuncio or the apostolic delegates in their country he's a man from the vatican or cardinal such and such in this or that country it never happens and yet the same catholic politicians 
will march with radical left-wing groups, shout and scream, say nothing when police are assaulted or even murdered on the streets of the US or assaulted on the streets of the UK or LGBTQ, teaching all that stuff, all that filth to children all over the world and these Catholic politicians won't say a word. Not even Melania Trump will say a word or Sean Hannity. In fact, I saw a clip a few days ago, Bill O'Reilly saying this Pope is a good Pope. He's a good guy. How do you define good, Bill? How do you define good? A man who calls himself Holy Father, a man who encourages what a billion people to pray to a dead woman. Is that a good man? A man who steals the glory from God Almighty. Is that a good man? And old Bill O'Reilly was defending EWTN. Of course, EWTN is a huge multi-million dollar Catholic uh, giant television radio and they're tied I think with church militants or militant church a very powerful conservative Catholic organization it was funny is this what our Catholic friends don't realize people like church militant uh, is that these are predominantly middle-class Americans uh, when they critique the Pope, what these Catholics don't realize is that they are actually sinning against their own church. It was, I think, Leo X, I think it was Leo X, and he said this, he said, uh, you the laity have no right to critique the church. And apparently, if you the laity uh, critique the church, you are mentally, uh, mentally deficient and uh, morally uh, delinquents I forget the exact wording but basically what he was saying was that any Catholic whether it's church militants in America or Opus Dei in Europe or there's a group in this country I forget the name church concerns no it's not church concerns there's a group in this country lay Catholics any Catholic anywhere in the world who critiques the Pope whether it's Sean Hannity or Bill O'Reilly is sinning against their church and of course they still have this purgatory system put in place to purge unrepentant Catholics. So it's always amusing for me as a former Catholic when I hear some of these conservative Catholics critiquing the current Pope uh, concerning his Marxist beliefs and what they say is correct, incidentally, but they're not allowed to criticise their Pope. Period. Of course they all do it. It goes back to Paul VI concerning the con uh, contraception issue. But the point is, officially, you're not allowed to do it. And if you do do it, you have to go to confession and tell the priest before you go to Mass. Crazy, just crazy. Twenty-five, but the man would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. And they knew her. They're going to rape her and abused her all the nights until the morning. All night raping her. These are sodomites, but of course, when something is offered to these people, it's like a pack of wolves. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. They've had enough fun with her. We go back to 24. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. And then will I bring out now and humble you them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. Just get away from the priest, basically. But unto this man, the Levite, or today the Jesuit, the Franciscan, the Dominican, do not sow a vile thing. This priest is given special status. Can't touch him. Now sometimes priests in the US, the UK, go to prison for their crimes against the state, but it's a rare thing. It's a rare thing. I mean, it's normally the guys at the bottom. You won't get a bishop or cardinal or a pope going to prison. It doesn't happen. They are protected. Even politicians. I remember when Blair was in office, and the police went to visit him about cash for honours. And he was not put under oath, but it was pretty near. And it was said at the time that had he been put under oath, he would have had to resign. Scandal. Money. But because he was a prime minister, they gave him special status. I remember when John Major was prime minister. Same sort of a thing. Sleeve scandal. The Tories making all this money. Cash for questions, cash for honours, now Boris in the same boat. Another slea scandal is following him around. But again, the police aren't going to arrest him. Of course they won't. They won't go to the White House tomorrow and arrest Joe Biden and Hunter Biden or Kamala 
Harris and her crimes, or other leading politicians, or Nancy Pelosi, they are untouchable. And of course, most of those people I just mentioned are Roman Catholic as well. Twenty-six. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day, and fell down at the door of the man's house, where her Lord was. Till it was light. She's barely alive. She's on her hands and her feet. She's crawling to the door, and it's been a terrible ordeal for her. To be fair, too, we're going back to those terrible uh, victims of paedophilia in Pennsylvania, and nobody went up to comfort them. Joe didn't go up. What a great photo opportunity, uh, opportunity that would have been. Melania didn't go up. Nancy didn't go up. Sean Hannity didn't go up. Bill O'Reilly didn't go up. None of them went up. Not one of them went up. And linked arms with their people. And demanded cardinals and archbishops put in prison. Never happened. And of course Fox News is a heavily pro-Catholic channel in America. And in the UK. Uh, Tony and Sheree Blair. Boris and his second wife. None of these Catholics will uh, go the extra mile for victims of paedophilia in their own church. 27. And the Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house, went out to go his way, and behold, this, and behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down, was fallen down at the door of the house. She's partially conscious, just about, and her hands were upon the threshold. She's basically got a hand on the door knob, she's barely alive she's been abused all night you can't imagine it can you a group of men just abusing her like a piece of meat while he's inside having a good drink with the elderly man who incidentally doesn't throw his daughter out to these animals but the priest throws his concubine out to these animals again expendable the priest has to survive the priest is untouchable whether it's the current pope or ratzinger archbishops cardinals i mean yeah the occasional parish priest goes to prison uh but a bishop very rare a cardinal i think maybe one or two i know pell the australian guy went to prison for what, a couple of years but he's back in rome he's still a priest he's still saying mass there's no call for him to be uh laocized as they call it have his license taken away from him yet they took Hans Kuhn's license away from him when he went against church teaching. Isn't that amazing? Theologians who went against church teaching had their licenses taken away from them, Hans Kuhn being one of them, like I say. And yet priests, Peter Farr priests, they're not laicized. They're moved from A to B like Bernard Law was, the infamous cardinal from Boston, or Mahoney from uh, California still living a good life in California, says Mass every day. It's incredible, really. 28, and he said unto her, up, and let us be going. Get yourself up, woman. Time to get moving. But none answered. You couldn't even answer. Then a man took her upon an ass, and the man rose up and got him unto his place. She's basically either dead or unconscious. He doesn't care. No empathy. He's had her She's now been abused all night. He's thrown into the wolves, basically. She's now in embarrassment. He wants to get back to Jerusalem, back to business. And the old man must be scratching his head. What's going on? I mean, it could have happened to his daughter. He offered the daughter. Uh, going back to Lot, offering his daughters to the Sodomites way back in Genesis 19. Again, standing in states, you can't really fathom it it is a paradox i mean lot is in heaven today samson is in heaven today jephthah is in heaven today jephthah sacrifices his daughter a burnt offering samson hanging around with gentiles philistines whores in heaven today and it's someone like john wesley couldn't handle that some of these wesleyan preachers i'm not knocking them i'm just pointing out that some of these people cannot handle biblical theology look at uh, 29 and when he was come into his house he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into 12 pieces 
and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. He's going to cut her up. Now, he starts off as a bit of a pervert, this guy. Picks up this young girl. He buys her for, what, 30 pieces of silver, shall we say? He's rough with her, shall we say? She runs from him. She finds solace with her father. He does what he can to protect his daughter, perhaps his only daughter. The priest arrives at his father-in-law's house. Knock, knock, let me in. He goes into the house. Please stay two, three, four, five days. There's food. There's a uh, drink available. Let's have a good time. And they do. Party time. The wife is probably upstairs hiding, maybe. No rush to go back with her abusive husband, because of course flesh meat and flesh uh, warrants a marriage, you understand. Eventually, on day six, it's time to move. He wants to go back to his place. Of course, it says the same about uh, Judas went to his place. But before he goes back to his place, he's got these sodomites outside the old man's house, banging on the door, wanting him, the priest, like they wanted uh, the angels, back in uh, Genesis. And when he was coming to his house, he took a knife, a butcher's knife. He's used to cutting up the animal, you see. I mean, a priest back in biblical times was like a butcher. Cut the animal, strip it down. Parts went here, parts went there, drain the blood. This guy knows what he's doing. He's like a surgeon. I laid his hand on the concubine, hold her down and divided her together. Of course, she's already dead, I'm sure, by this point. Divided her together with her bones into 12 pieces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Northern tribe, southern tribe. And what's the guy doing? He's devil possessed. And sent her into all of the coasts of Israel. So it's bad enough to rape somebody. It's bad enough to kill somebody. But to cut them up. I mean, next you'll be reading it. He's going to eat the remains. That doesn't happen. But many times when uh, murderers have uh, cut their victims into pieces, ate their remains. And so it was, 30. All that saw it said, there was no such deed done nor seen from the day that children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Absolutely so. This is a president, a shocking president. Pervert priest, murdering priest. Sadistic, devil possessed. Consider it, consider of it. Take advice and speak your minds they're going to hold an emergency meeting what are we going to do we've got this woman's remains arriving all over the place did he pick 12 animals or did he throw the remains here and there as he was traveling around back to his home or leaving his home we're not told how he got rid of the body the parts of the body but what an interesting character. I mean, it is an interesting account. Was the guy saved? Absolutely not. There's no suggestion, not even an inference, this guy was saved. Jephthah, yeah. Lot, definitely. Samson, absolutely. But this chap, no. 20. Going into 21. There's almost a civil war. And I think the figure of around 25,000 people will lose their lives due to the devilish behavior of a Levite priest. And of course, the Jews get together, they go up to Benjamin and say, hand over the sons of Belial. The Baalites, basically. Sons of Satan, more specifically. Hand them over to us. Of course, the Levite doesn't tell the whole story to the other tribes of Israel. He tells them what he wants them to know. And they should have said to him, you're going to die for this, Mr. Priest. But they don't. Again, Respect to our persons. Catholics in this country, in the US, and all over Europe, and probably else, elsewhere around the world, they show great favoritism to priests. They bend over backwards to allow them to get away with what they get away with. And yet, if a white man gets up, or if a Christian man gets up, and preaches against this or that, or says this or that, they slap him down. No mercy. No will give him the benefit of the doubt. They slap him down. They forced him out. Was it two, two nights ago? The Israeli ambassador went to the London School of Economics, the LSE in London, a very left-wing, very left-wing university in London. Of course, the Israeli government now is left-wing. So I guess she's on the left. And she went to the LSE and they ran her out of town. 
and special branch had to get her out of the building pile her into a car armed car and they had to get her back to the embassy they shut her down that's the power of the left and she's on the left but of course her left is the wrong type of a left if you know what i mean so i think that's enough for this morning just a very general read through like i say looking at judges 19 yes it's a fascinating and also very sad account of a man who may have started off well we're not told but along the way went the, uh, went the wrong way and not only would he throw his wife uh, to the dogs literally not only would they abuse her all night literally but he then cuts her up which is demonism basically when somebody cuts up a person like this guy did who didn't need to do that but did it anyway out of contempt i guess and on top of that sends a parts out all over israel then what's going through the mind of such a man he's devil possessed and those that come into contact with him don't correct him don't confront him don't call him to repent uh, the other tribes of israel should have held him should have had a, a court case as it were and they would have put him to death for murder but no he's allowed to go his way special status can't touch me i'm a catholic priest i serve holy mother church some groups in this world you can't touch some people in this world are given special status it's incredible really isn't it when you throw out the word of god and you embrace multiculturalism ecumenicalism interfaith all that stuff and the whole world just goes to hell basically this guy wasn't saved i am convinced of that the concubine poor girl working class family went to the highest bidder basically had a terrible life had an awful death the parts went all over israel hopefully they were later, they were later buried Twenty-five thousand die due to this devilish behavior like i say of the levite and he probably goes off into the sunsets and lives on his life it's like after world war ii all these people got out of nuremberg they weren't all held to accounts after world war ii and a lot of those nazis and a good number a roman catholic as well like van uh, van uh, papen lived on until the 80s but here's a thought just a quick thought to put on camera it is interesting to me and i am a bit of a student when it comes to the 20th century it's interesting to me after world war ii when the nazis went to south america operation paperclip and uh someone like bishop hoodle got them out of europe because of course they were catholic and those that didn't go to uh south america went to america put the man on the moon 1969 so much you could say all those nazis just beat the rap went to work in america helped nasa but what's interesting to me is how mossad quite rightly tracked down uh a good number of the nazis like eichmann they almost got Mengele, but not quite but there was never any dedication there was never any uh passion or commitment to go after those that died in soviet russia a lot of jews died in russia from the 1920s up until the 1950s if i think more more jews probably died in russia than in uh, nazi europe and as far as i know mossad's goal was never to go after the soviets and bring them to book but only go after the nazis and all i can assume from that is perhaps possibly again not very good english but possibly perhaps uh, due to the fact that uh, israel was at the time a left-wing government not wanting to fall out of the left-wing country like uh, russia whereas of course those catholic countries were right wing catholic countries and it was easy i suppose perhaps possibly for mossad to go after those people but it's inconsistency see israel inconsistent it starts back in judges inconsistent not putting this levite to death for his sin of decapitating his concubine he's able to walk it and after the war only going after the nazis not the soviets it's an inconsistency isn't it so just a quick thought to put down on camera but i think for this morning i've said enough uh, concerning 
the book of judges yes it's a very interesting account the entire book is very interesting all 21 chapters it's also a very sad book because it shows also that jehovah would just step back and say you don't do it, you don't do it my way do it yourself and you're going to have murder you're going to have sodomy you're going to disgrace uh the tabernacle the uh levite priest system the gentiles are going to blaspheme my name and of course it runs its course and uh, it just ends in catastrophe for the people of Israel because, because of course every generation ends in apostasy so I think on that point I will sign out now and uh, wrap this video up uh, and just say one final thing actually that uh, don't allow sin to rule you don't say well I can't help it blah blah you have to help it you have to push back deal with temptation don't allow it just to run you take you over uh, don't allow sin to run you Romans chapter 6 but put sin down control it this Levite could have gone down in scripture as a great man I mean even Samuel and Samson are great guys in the sense that they did love Jehovah they walked with him like David and Gideon and uh, even Solomon to some extent uh, and are all in heaven today but no this Levite went against the grain went against even the basic levels of morality, integrity, and uh, holiness, and is burning in hell today. Devil possessed, I do believe, a pervert, quite possibly, but it wasn't just him, it was the company that he was keeping. They allowed him to get away with it, like priests today in the Catholic Church, or even in the Church of England. The Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, in fact, that American Mormon living in turkey at the moment with his soon-to-be wife she's got no idea what she's getting herself into going back to the founders of the mormon church smith young having young concubines young wives sister wives as they're called it's just incredible really how what do they say how men never learn from history and it's absolutely true it's like a circle a vicious circle which goes round and round and round and it takes a very bold man to break that cycle and that circle and say that's it we're, fr we're, we're through no more going back to the customs of our fathers snatching women off the streets not even realizing it's a nasty custom found in the last chapter of judges to compensate the loss of the benjamite the benjamin the benjamite tribe the tribe of benjamin <laughs> i'll get it out in a minute no need to uh repeat that custom way back in judges because of course these people don't even know the bibles the heathen which is even more frightening isn't it it's how people are following bad practices which are in the bible but aren't ordained of god god wasn't behind this he didn't want this priest to go around killing this young girl or sodomites to abuse her all night but you see man has a free will and if you don't control your own will your flesh will control it for you and that's what Romans 7 is all about. So I wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Again, it's the two parts of the believer. This guy wasn't saved, but he was religious. And I'm almost certain he wasn't saved. I should just probably further clarify that. I'm pretty certain he wasn't saved, but who knows? Other people are found in uh, Hebrews 11. And even Manasseh, the most wicked king in the Old Testament, says later on in Second Chronicles how he knew that God was God so you can't say for sure this guy didn't repent later on but based on this one account in judges 19 and no more scripture to go with it looks pretty bad for him bleak and a priest highly thought of in a circle and yet a devil just a devil like so many religious people lost dead from their cup and will have a shock when they pass away so i'm going to sign out now Wish you every peace and blessing, and I'll speak to you all in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.